Welcome, welcome everybody to this stupendous occasion of our final Amen Institute articulation of the season. The Amen Institute is where art is formed in Torah and Torah informs art. Today we have the great honor and privilege to be brought in on the journey that has taken us for through this entire year a journey of introspection and deep reflection on the themes of Yom Kippur and their intersection with the Holocaust. We have no better host of two incredibly impressive artists and rabbi, by the end of this presentation, you decide which is which, um, <laughs> of individuals who have spent their lives thinking about the the Holocaust's own impact on their own lives and individuals who have brought forth wisdom and thoughts that we will see visually and through language to express what is inexpressible in language. Rabbi Katz is the chair of the Talmud department of Yeshivat Chovavei Torah and Jeffrey Lawrence from hailing from New Mexico has expressed in his art many, many, many paintings with great detail. Um, what is truly perplexing and indescribable of the story of the Holocaust. Um, I don't want to take more time from from this presentation, and I would like uh, Rabbi Katz to please frame the avoda service for us and um, its relationship with. Uh, I thought that Jeffrey's going to uh, that Jeffrey's going to go first, and then um, I'll follow sure. up on Jeffrey. So, sure. Jeffrey, sure. go ahead. Sure. sure. You want me to 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 start? Yep, that's sure. what we said, Jeffrey. It's the right. floor, okay. floor is yours. Let's go into your presentation. Oh dear. Well, <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I want to thank Vera and uh, Rabbi Saska, really from the bottom of my heart, for their kindness and support during this this journey we've all three of us taken with my painting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about myself and then I'll talk through the various stages that the painting has taken. Um, basically, um, I'm the child of Holocaust survivors and uh, it was hidden from me that uh, I was Jewish for a long time. In fact, my mother would not admit I was Jewish until I was 47 uh, in 1996. And um, up to that point, I, I couldn't let myself paint about it because it was um, the elephant in the room. But once I had her actually con confirm it, um, I felt free to sort of paint about it. And uh, of course, it's been with me all my life. I knew my father had been in Dachau and Sachsenhausen and my mother was on the kinder transport. And I knew all this stuff, but still it, it was never admitted. And so I haven't been brought up with the Torah. I haven't been brought up with the Jewish faith. Um, I had to find out about it myself after 1996. Um, and uh, I felt compelled to try and work through painting my questions about the Holocaust. And so when Devere contacted me, uh, presumably because he'd seen some of my Holocaust work, um, which has had various shows and was in museums and stuff, um, I, felt, I felt I should take it on. It felt important to me to do it, but I absolutely didn't know what I was doing. And, uh, I know that sometimes my paintings can upset people or provoke people or whatever, but I feel compelled to actually paint my truth rather than um, rather than try and make pretty pictures about things. So can we have the first slide? So this is the final painting. It looks a bit dark on my screen. I don't know what you can see on yours. Um, 
Uh, one of the things that I have a big problem with with digital reality these days is that paintings are not paintings on a screen. They're paintings on a wall. And you don't get the actual reality of standing in front of this thing. Um, all the colors, I don't know what color everybody's screen is. But um, I was given the subject of atonement. And um, I thought long and hard about this uh, at first. Uh, Dvir sent me the actual text from the Torah about Aaron and uh, him being asked to slaughter three goats and two rams and uh, make a mark of the blood um, on the temple. And, um, and I started thinking about that subject. And so the first slide, please. So the first thing I did was I started drawing. I always start with drawings for paintings because, um, you know, you have to work out your thoughts through drawing, or I do anyway. So I did this drawing and then I thought, well, this just is gonna be an illustration of the text. I, I didn't wanna make an illustration. I wanted to get to the basis of it. Uh, and here you see Aaron with blood on his hands looking up and stuff. And stuff. And I thought, no, no, I've got to take this deeper. And so uh, next slide, please. That's when I came up with this. And I realized that Auschwitz is the temple. And uh, the goats are us. And I, you know, I'll talk a little bit about what I think about the meaning of all this uh, at the end, but I want to show you the process I went through first. So originally I thought I'm going to have blood on the hands. Um, and so I started the painting. Next slide, please. And the way that I work is I work indirectly. I paint in layers. So I start with a basic underpainting layer of one color and white. And in this case, it was uh, a dark gray, actually, uh, a gray black. And, um, and at this point, I was gonna put the blood on the hands later. I thought I better get the thing covered first. So next slide, please. So here you've got, uh, you know, an advanced underpainting um, with the goats. Uh, fully realized for the moment. Um, next slide, please. So this is the finished underpainting um, of what I'm going to paint on top in color. And there are reasons why I paint the way I paint. It's basically classical technique uh, that was used for hundreds of years. It was only in the 20th century that people decided they didn't need to do all this stuff anymore. Uh, and the paintings today look accordingly. But there was a reason why they did this, and that is in terms of light reflection. So at this point, I then go to two colors and white, uh, a warm color and a cool color. So can we have the next slide, please? So on top of that painting, I've put a yellow glaze over the, over the lights. And then I've started painting in the face and on the talus with uh, two colors, red and green. Um, next slide, please. Um, here you've got a more advanced uh, underpainting and warm, cool level. Um, and at this point, I was talking a lot with uh, uh, Rabbi Soska about, about the meaning of it and what I thought I was doing and um, what I might change. Uh, next slide, please. So at this point, that's the finished warm, cool layer. 
Uh, I didn't have to warm cool the um, background uh, with Arbeit Mach Frei um, because I wanted it to somehow be sort of misty and and a bit um, as if you were arriving at Auschwitz at night. Uh, and um, I started marbling the, the pillars and uh, um, at that point, we're just in the two colors, red and green. Next slide, please. Actually, I also put a glaze over him because I suddenly realized at this point that, you know, he wasn't a nice white boy from Brooklyn. He was actually a desert dweller and would be darker. So that's why I put a sort of a, a, a sepia glaze over his skin to make him look uh, look more Middle Eastern. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and at this point, then we come to the final stages. And I haven't put the smoke in from the incense yet. Um, and as you can see, you know, the color is fully realized. But when I got to this point, I realized it doesn't need the blood on the hands. That's just laboring the point and um, making it too melodramatic. I know it's in the Torah, but it just seemed wrong for me and, and um, that this would be a more, more of a universal um, image rather than a specific image. Uh, and then the next slide, please. And then at this point, of course, I've, I've fiddled with things a little bit. I've increased the shadows on the face. I've, I've, I've fiddled here and there. And then I've put the smoke in. And I've sort of obscured the, the, the background. So it's a sort of a more of a mysterious, um, slightly dread-making thing. Uh, and I can assure you, when you actually see the painting, you see more in it. But... Um, and I explained to Rabbi uh, Isoska that a painting is never finished. It's just where you stop. You know, I'm sure it, once it's fully dry, I'll look at it and think, oh, that needs just touching up there or changing there or whatever. Very minimal changes probably, but still, um, a painting is just where you stop, where you run out of steam or... Uh, in the case of artists, usually when you've got an exhibit and, you, and time's run out, as was the case here. I was very worried for a, a while that I wouldn't get this finished uh, in time for the presentation. Uh, the final slide, please. Uh, where's the final slide? There we go. Nope. We're back at the other one. There you go. So my struggle with this whole story, first of all, uh, I had a lot of discussions with Rabbi Isoska about in the passage, it says that uh, Aaron is making sacrifice for the sins of the Jews. And I said, well, what sins? What are these sins that they, that they had already committed before they even committed any, before the, the Ten Commandments and what have you? and uh, making atonement for something. I, I didn't understand that. And then, you know, in my understanding about this piece, I mean, for me, the paintings are about um, my connection to the Holocaust. Uh, and I don't think I've ever done a painting, whether it was a still life or, a, you know, uh, just a, a portrait or whatever, that isn't somehow touched by it, because it's been there all my life. And um, it seeps into everything. But uh, in the case of, of, of this, this painting, when I took on atonement, my big question was, is atonement possible at all? Can the Germans ever atone for what they did? I don't think atonement is possible. I think there is um, acceptance and there is forgiveness but full atonement, undoing the thing that you did, I don't think that's possible. 
So that's why I tried to get that into Aaron's face, this question. I didn't want him to look like he was whining or complaining or um, scared or um, uh, angry uh, or pleading. I wanted Aaron to look as if he was directly connecting, asking why. And so hopefully that comes across. Um, I still haven't answered the question about atonement in my mind. Um, I think that you, you could, there are different levels, but something as colossal as killing 6 million Jews, I, how do you atone for that? Um, if you think that everything is written, that's another story. But uh, as for who the writer is, I, I'm not sure. Anyway, I hope you um, enjoy the painting and that it has some meaning. I just wanted to point out with this last image that I actually always take the paintings around the corner of the canvas because paintings are a three-dimensional thing. And, uh, and that's something that people miss in looking at everything in digital form. Uh, they're not seeing that paintings are three-dimensional. They have impasto, they have uh, texture. And um, in my case, I realized there was absolutely no reason to frame things anymore. Frames were a necessity when uh, the Christian church was carrying images around uh, on donkeys to different churches, but they're not necessary anymore. And so, I decided to abandon framing things and actually paint the edges of the canvas as well. So you get to see the other ear of the goat on the left and the backside of the ram on the right. And, um, and I think it makes a more interesting thing. It makes a, an object rather than a flat window. So um, that's about it. That's all, about all I have to say. For the moment. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you. Rabbi Thank you yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I have to start off by saying just that um, obviously uh, I, uh, I've heard this presentation time and again from you, Jeffrey, and it doesn't fail to uh, provoke me each time. And there's something so evocative and so powerful about this image that is just incredible. As I'm listening to you, I'm just kind of holding back all these emotions. Uh, that this painting evokes, and it was just incredible. Um, so I want to first start out with uh, with a real thank you to uh, the Veer and the Amen Institute. Um, it's interesting that um, the images that um, Jeffrey drew were these goats, and some are for me, since I filter everything through uh, Talmud and the rabbis. And one of the lines that the rabbis um, have in the Gemara is, which means basically more than the um, cow what wants to feed the calf, the calf, I'm sorry, more than the, the calf wants to um, eat, the mother wants to feed. Um, and um, more, much more than I wanted to teach about art um, through the prism of Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey's piece, uh, I feel, feel that I'm the student here. Um, really. Um, I think that this pairing between me and Jeffrey uh, is mamish asyata deshmaya. I've learned so much from Jeffrey, and um, um, I know that when you do a certain amount of shiduchim, you go to a certain place in Olam Haba. So I think, um, Devere, you can add this one to number one, or however far along you are in the shiduchim uh, lineup. Uh, this can definitely count as one because this was a really incredible uh, partnership, and I've learned tremendously from uh, Jeffrey over the course of this year. Um, more specifically about the painting and our our chavruta, um, I just um, it's kind of interesting because I don't know about other rabbis um, in the group, um, but I was paired with two people. I was paired with Toby Khan, um, and I was paired, paired now with Jeffrey. And um, as someone who believes that um, nothing is by accident, that everything has a reason and a plan. It is interesting that both of the people that I was paired with got parshiot that has to do with, with the book of Leviticus, but the book of Yikra. 
right? Uh, Toby did uh, Vayikra, Toby did the first Parsha in Leviticus, and Technically speaking, the the Torah portion that Jeffrey was Jeffrey and I were assigned is Parshat Achre, Achre Mot. Now it's kind of interesting that Achre Mot talks about the Avodah of Yom Kippurim, which is the Avodah that we're going to be reflecting on in less than thirty six hours on Yom Kippur. Um, but before we get to the specifics, I'm going to back up a little bit and talk about overall Korbanot and why, how much, what I've learned specifically about uh, Jeffrey's treatment of Korbanot. So, um, to 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 kind of reveal my bias right away, I happen to like the study of Korbanot. <clears throat> And I know this makes me an anomaly. Most people find the study of Kribbanot either redundant or uh, bothersome and so on and so forth. Um, my love of the study of sacrifices goes back a very, very, very long time. Um, for those of you who um, have studied with me, have heard me say this um, before, um, I was privileged, or maybe you would call it not privileged, uh, that my grandfather, um, who was a Rosh Yeshiva in the Haredi community, uh, was a very all-time Rosh Yeshiva. And uh, when I was 13 and I uh, was in Yeshiva, I was expected to be Yeshiva at six o'clock in the morning. And my grandfather thought that six o'clock is for losers, for slackers. Slackers start their day at 6 a.m. The real dedicated learners start their day at 5 a.m. So literally from the day I turned 13, uh, my grandfather and I had a chavruta every morning um, for an hour from five to six. He would wake me up every uh, morning at 4.30, the phone would ring and he would just say, good morning, boom, and then he would see me half an hour later. And for two and a half years, I studied with him the tractates of Zvachim and Minachot, which basically discuss uh, the various rules of the Korbanot. And since then, I fell in love with the study of Korbanot. Um, and I still love it. I love it not because I love killing animals. Uh, I love it because once you get past the killing, killing of animals, there's a credible amount of theology uh, and philosophy and psychology in the whole enterprise of temple and sacrifice. But right now I want to focus uh, particularly on, uh, the on the temple and then the sacrifice, because um, as you know, and I'm going to share with you some sources, uh, I'm, after all, I am a rabbi. What is a rabbi without teaching some sources? So after all, we, many of you know that especially Maimonides was deeply troubled by the sacrifices. You know, what is it? It sounds so idolatrous. It sounds so, um, you know, uh, Abu Dazara like And Maimonides, of course, has this radical idea that um, Korbanot was just a temporary concession, a temporary agreement. You know, the Jews came from Egypt. In Egypt, the way they served their God was through sacrifices. So um, God said, you know what, fine. You can do sacrifices and that will be fine. Uh, so that's my Maimonides' um, solution, um, that it's only a temporary concession and it will be fine. It will be only uh, for a short while. Um, obviously, Nachmanides is very troubled by that. And Nachmanides kind of, you know, rips into him. Um, he's very harsh to him um, about this idea. But I want to make a different suggestion. I want to make argue that we got it all wrong, that the means and the end are confused. And the sac we normally think, we normally assume that the temple is the means and the sacrifices at the end. In other words, God made us build the temple. And why did he make us build the temple? So that we have a venue in which we can bring the korban out. I suspect that's actually the opposite. The temple was a mecca of art. Art makes us wonder. Art brings us in the presence of the ineffable Art takes us out of the mundane. And the korbanot were just simply a means to get us to come to the temple so that we can be in the presence of the beautiful aesthetics of the temple. Uh, and in fact, um, the sources support my argument. It says, uh, for example, there's a midrash that says, the primary responsibility for a person is to come, drop off the korban, let the coin do the rest. So if the Jew who brings the korban doesn't do anything else, what's the point of making him come there? And I believe the purpose of coming there is so that they can luxuriate and appreciate and uh, absorb the art. And I, uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the sources, but there are quite a few sources that support the thesis, the thesis that the point is to get there and to enjoy it. So that brings me to um, 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 Toby and then Jeffrey. 
Toby showed me final pieces and I was able to appreciate the art and appreciate the beauty in what Toby was doing. With Jeffrey, I was blessed to not just be confronted with the final pieces, but the stuff that you have just seen in 15 minutes, I was privileged to spend almost a year seeing the process. And this for me was an incredible insight in art that I've never had before. So those of you who know me again know that I love art. And in the next, uh, in the next incarnation, I'm just probably gonna study uh, art history. Um, but for now, I have to satisfy myself with uh, going to museums and looking at art. And all of us who look at art, look at a final product. And we don't pause to stop and appreciate the process. What is the process of making art? And that I think is what Jeffrey taught me um, over the course of these few months is the depth and the thought and the um, insight and the um, passion that goes into the process. I mean, I have to say that if I have looked through your slide, Jeffrey, on my own, I would have not seen anything other than, yeah, lighter, darker, um, higher, lower. And then to hear you speak with such depth and with such nuance about how the the picture evolved the picture is building and developing and, and those layers don't go away those layers lie beneath the surface all the time and i feel that that actually corresponds very nicely with the, the portion that we are assigned the torah portion that we are assigned because the torah portion that we are assigned discusses the um avod of the and yom kippur right and there's a very detailed process that the torah spells out and the rabbis tell us that because of the way the Torah sets it up, seder is ma'akev. That's a rabbinic term. Seder ma'akev means don't think that this is all about an end. At the end of Yom Kippur, make sure to accomplish X, Y, and Z. No, 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 no. The Torah describes the process because process is integral to product. In fact, I would argue that for a vote that Yom Kippur and process is product. And I think that's what I've learned, Jeffrey, from observing you, is that in a real art experience, process is product. Because when I look at your picture, given that I was privy to the different stages, I actually still see the layers and the layers and the layers. And all of a sudden, the process is part of the product. When I look at your art, I'm seeing multiple pieces of art, not one piece of art. And I just want to finish with kind of add that, in fact, I believe that that's literally the religious journey. Um, if you're a Sephardi, you say it every day. If you're Ashkenazi, you say it on Shabbat. Um, we say, Kol halachot b'chol yom miftach lo shuhu ben olam haba. Anybody who studies halacha every day will go to olam haba. He's guaranteed he's going to go to olam haba. Shunemar halichot olam lo al tikru halichot ela halachot. Right? So the rabbis take the word halichot, which means to go, and they read it as halachot rules. Now, why do the rabbis say anybody who studies halacha will go to Olam Abba? I would have thought that the rabbis would say anybody who practices halacha. But I think that one of the misnomers that we in the Orthodox community have is that we again assume that living a halachic life is exclusively about product. It's about at the end of the day, did you put on the tzitzit? Did you not put on the tzitzit? Did you eat the matzah? Did you not eat the matzah? Did you keep Shabbos? Did you not keep Shabbos? And I think the message from Kol Hashone Halachot and from the fact that Halacha and Halicha is the same is precisely that process is product. To be a Halachic Jew is not exclusively about whether you have done X, Y, and Z. Of course, X, Y, and Z is part of it. But the, pro the question is, are you in the process? Are you in the project? of living a life of halacha. And that life of halacha evolves and builds and develops. And sometimes you kind of erase, right? As we saw, Jeffrey, sometimes adding color, taking off color, putting on the blood, taking off the blood. So I feel that um, really, Jeffrey, uh, the so to speak Tvar Torah that me as the rabbi partner is supposed to produce wrote itself. Just to kind of, like I said, see the process and learn from that how much process can be product. A for Yom Kippur, and I think more globally in general for the religious life. And um, I think part of the 
downside of not appreciating this is that oftentimes, you know, when we make a mistake halachically or when we've done the wrong thing for a year or two or for a while and we kind of beat ourselves up, I think part of the problem is that we then realize, yeah, of course, we got to be careful not to make mistakes. Of course, we have to be careful to do the right thing. But we also have to keep in mind that the process is integral to the Avodat Hashem of what it means to live a halachic life. And um, I will be forever indebted to you, Jeffrey. I mean, I was going to interrupt you when you said Rabbi Yisaskar and say Yisaskar, but fine, I'll let you call you call me Rabbi Yisaskar. But in my book, um, henceforth, you are going to be Rabbi Jeffrey. And I say that with all seriousness <laughs> because I, I, you know, I'm not saying it as a joke. I really seriously have taught because I've spent, we have spent hours together. We have spent hours together, Jeffrey, and uh, to see the depth of the neshama that you bring to this process have really taught me in a way as I'll be forever indebted to you. And it was really, really the, a privilege. So thank the you. The hours have been precious to me, very, very thank precious. You. And thank I've you. been honored to, to be able to spend them with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeffrey, would you want to expand a little bit in general about your um, art journey uh, related to also to your own personal journey about the Holocaust? Well, I, you know, I've been, I mull over questions in my head that never get answered. I, I did a painting about uh, the yellow stars to do with the fact that every household must have had a box of yellow fabric. People didn't get given yellow fabric. I've never seen a photo of this box that must have had scraps of yellow fabric, but every household must have had one. So I made a painting of a box with yellow fabrics with a star and a needle and threads through it. Um, things like that. You know, my last painting I did uh, was about my aunt who I never got to meet because she killed herself um, in 1939 um, before my grandparents killed themselves. And uh, uh, I only had this one little, when my father died, I received this one little tiny black and white photo that's like uh, four inches by four inches of her. And I, I, it's the only image I have of her. And so, um, uh, I thought I would make a memorial for her. So I painted this painting. Um, I can't show it to you now, but um, um, it's on my website. Uh, and um, her name was Anna, Anna Marie. And um, I put a doll in it with uh, a yellow star on because I suddenly thought, well, if everybody had to wear a yellow star, then Every little girl is going to say, Mom, I want my doll to have a yellow star. Now, I've never seen a picture of a doll with a yellow star, but I absolutely know that happened. So those are the sort of things I paint about because they're questions in my head. They're, they're questions about what it actually was like to be a human in that situation. Uh, you know, the, the trouble with the Holocaust is that uh, it's been turned into a cliche in movies and books and this and that. I mean, there's just this constant. At one point I read there was like 400 films about the Holocaust come out every year. Uh, to, I mean, connected to it. And I, I just thought, well, this is just, this is not about people. This is about some weird kind of perverse entertainment. Um, and I've met many people who uh, find me sort of like a trophy Holocaust person or something. I don't know. I can't explain it. It's just, uh, I've been dealing with it all my life. Just recently, my father was honored at Dachau uh, for the 77th uh, um, uh, celebrations uh, um, of the, um, you know, the, the um, forgotten the word. Kristallnacht. Uh, no, not Kristallnacht, when they liberated the camp. Mm -hmm. they, it was a month ago, I think. Uh, and he had a specific, he was a, they, they've honored him in the museum because he not only was in Dachau, but he escaped, joined the American army and went back and liberated Dachau. And for that reason, they, they actually had a presentation about him and they showed my work. Uh, and, um, you know, this stuff is very real to me. I can't, I can't say that, you know, it's a terrible legacy. 
the shadow of Hitler is, is, is still over us all. Um, and so I, I, uh, I have to find some way to deal with it. And my method of dealing with it is to paint. I, I'm not a writer. Um, I'm, I'm not really a social worker. My contribution is to do it through paintings and hope that people will reflect and be moved emotionally. Because I think that it's the emotional responses that prevent people from doing the horrendous things they do. If you can feel someone's pain, you're not gonna inflict it. It's when people become so, so desensitized that they feel nothing. And I think that that's what art is for. It's to make people feel, to make, to go places that, so that other people don't have to. And um, in my discussions with uh, Soska, I, I really learned a lot about the connection. You're not Rabbi Jeffrey, I'm not Rabbi Soska, or even. It's perfect. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry, uh, I couldn't. Go ahead. Thank you. I appreciate it. Just you saw Well, you know. No, no, no. I'm perfect. I try and please everybody. Perfect. Um, perfect. Um, but in our uh, in our discussions, uh, it really opened me up to uh, much more connection to uh, what we've been actually thinking about for five thousand years. I mean, that means something that we we as a people have been mulling this stuff over for 5,000 years. So, um, so I'm, I'm deeply in, indebted for being allowed to make this journey. I have to say that I didn't expect it to take me all year. And, <laughs> uh, and I know that my painting experiences are mystical anyway. I never know what's gonna happen. I never know what's gonna come out of me. I, you have to get engaged with the process as, as you say and let the thing unfold because it painted it. I didn't paint it, I just turned up. It made the painting. And uh, I'm just the, the, the vessel that, that it uses to uh, get itself out there. I'm sure there are a lot of questions that people I can ask. I just wanna kind of highlight the two lines, Jeffrey, that really, I'm going to stay with me is that first line that you said to me, which I never thought of it, but I really appreciate it, is the fact that a painting was never done. Um, and like I said, that allowed me, uh, there's an author, um, Jhumpa Lahiri, Jhumpa Lahiri. Jhumpa Lahiri is a author, she originally from uh, India, and one of her first books is was a book of short stories. Um, if anybody remembers the name of the book, uh, please uh, help me out here. Malady, something Maladies, the interpreter of Maladies. Anyway, but one of the reasons why I loved her book so much is because her short stories were never finished. And it mm. let you finish the story on your own. You know, it's, you went on thinking, okay, so what happened the next day? I mean, she left you in the middle of a Tuesday. And then you think, okay, what happened Wednesday? I never thought that way about art um, somehow. Now that you kind of, you know, open that window for me, I feel like I want to go back to, back to every piece of art that I've ever seen and kind of think, so what's the next story? What's the next um, page? What's the Absolutely. next chapter? It's just incredible. Absolutely. And the last line you just said, I want to just say, when you said that um, you didn't write it, it wrote itself, which is a whole nother um, deep insight. Um, and there is a there's a tradition in, uh, within Judaism about auto writing, it's called, and what that means that your soul comes out and writes. Um, I, um, I always think of one statement in the rabbinic tradition, which is so powerful. And when you said it's mystical, is the rabbis identified the first word in the Ten Commandments is Anochi. And Anochi, uh, the rabbis say, is an acronym, which is Ana Nafshahi Ketavit Ihavit. In a person's writing, you can identify a person's soul. And now for the rabbis to say that about the Bible, it's just pretty powerful to say that you can identify God's soul in the Bible. But when you say that the painting writes it, you're just there, somehow I hear echoes of that. And uh, it's just powerful, just powerful. Like I said, uh, the privilege to kind of hear an artist and see an artist working is uh, so new for me and so insightful. So I just want to reiterate my thanks. Um, I think Vera, um, um, your father had a comment that Yes, yes. He says, how close the Avoda service is to the martyology service, martyriology service. 
I think Rabbi Kahana, like in typical rabbinic fashion, a rabbi's question is an answer. So why don't you tell us, Rabbi Kahana? <laughs> we would love to hear from you the answer to the question, because I think none of us would have as good an answer as you. It's a beautiful are, presentation, profound on both sides. We are reduced. Maybe our purpose is to be the core the very soul of the world and in the Anuk, in your Anukhi. And incredibly, at the text of position, I love the two. Oh, that's the position when we are in the upload, we are, we're trembling in the very heart of Aeon Kippur. We're trembling because we're uh, the only creatures that can live in abdomen and still continue. That the Yom Kippur so, service, the Yom Kippur oh service God was in front of us. The Yom Kippur service presents the challenge where we have to as humans, we're able to live in atonement and other creatures don't have the ability to then move past it. And live in atonement and still continue. And still continue. Believe in God. And believe in I God. Need God. And how do you see that connected to martology, Rabbi Kana? Because we are actually trembling uh -huh. for our lives, especially in the Alpha world. Because we're trembling with our lives, and especially in the Avoda moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful question. Thanks. Thanks. So Thank profound. So profound. There was another question um, in the chat as well, which um, is addressed to you, Jeffrey, regarding um, the clothing of Aaron. And curious if you had any insights into why he, underneath his talus, he appears to be not garbed in anything else. Um, I, you know, reading the passage, he has a special tunic and it's made of linen and it's very, you know, very described. But um, I felt for the painting, um, it would make things too busy. And also that if he was a desert dweller, i.e. it's very hot. And um, he's also a goat herder because he's got a whole bunch of goats there and rams. I didn't think he'd be wearing something as uh, enclosing. Um, and, you know, the painting is a metaphor. I'm not trying to make an illustration of that passage. I mean, this was the, that was my decision right from the beginning when I went from that first drawing and realized I don't want to make an illustration here. 
what, you know, one of the big questions in art always is, what's the difference between illustration uh, and art and a piece of art? Uh, and in my mind, an illustration shows you what you already know and art shows you something you've never seen before. In, in order for illustrations to work, you have to be familiar with what you're looking at. So in other words, the teapot has to look like a teapot. That's an illustration. But if the teapot suddenly looks like an elephant, then you're stepping into a world you haven't actually experienced before. And, uh, and for me, it's a, it's a question in my mind about what it is that we do as artists. I, I think the world has become so, so literal because of the internet and the camera. Um, that people can't seem to step outside of reality in the, the reality they think they're seeing. Because it's, it's, it's not what they're seeing. It's not the reality. It's the reality they think they're seeing because it's familiar. Uh, whereas um, I think when you see something that, that really moves you into a different place, um, it's not a literal translation. That's my take on it. And so that was the decision I made. At first I was gonna make the, get the tunic made and have him, you know, so that I had something on a model that I could paint and copy and this and that. And I thought, no, this is, this is just isn't right. The, the most meaningful thing, I mean, was Aaron wearing a tallies? How do I know? Did they even exist at that time? That is a desert dweller's uh, piece of clothing, but it's become this other symbol uh, because no one is living like that anymore. So uh, at what point do you leave the description and go to the world that you understand rather than is written? You remind me of a, uh, a critic who once wrote about the, you know, the first principle question of the pros and cons of illustrating biblical stories. And one of the points that he made was that, you know, one might one argue that the idea of illustrating biblical stories in and of itself is incompatible with the premise of the biblical story, which is one that's meant to percolate in our ima imagination and make our own images. And once Absolutely. you concretize that within a painting, you've decided, oh, this is what it looked like, you know? Absolutely. So I like the fact that you were not, um, you know, um, conservative and you didn't stick to exactly the text because that's the whole point. The whole point is that you kind of take it and imagine it in your mind the way you imagine it. Oftentimes, when I teach about um, art and the Bible, I'll take you know various paintings of the of the Akedah, right, of the Binding of Isaac, and you look at different artists who have different illustrations who see different stories. They really sure. are different stories. But I've so, seen uh, also seen a lot of religious art where you know Jesus looks like uh, a surfer from California with blonde <laughs> hair and, and and a tan, and and it's all it's absurd. Right. You know, um, so, and I was focusing much more on the connection between his eyes and <laughs> right. that for me, that was the focus of the painting was his eyes. And so I made a real feature about, about them. I mean, I, I really struggled with those eyes and made sure that they, they had the right kind of stare. They weren't, popping out of his head and they weren't, um, you know, I, I mean, I, the thing about paintings also is that, as you said, they develop by themselves. And so I have to listen to what the painting wants. It speaks to me. I, I just do what it asks me to do. You'd be amazed how often, I mean, paintings have voices. They're very, very, very subtle and you have to listen very, very closely. But when it doesn't want you to do something, it doesn't let you do it. It just doesn't work. And it's amazing. I mean, literally, my will has nothing to do with it. It decided that it wanted to be like that. I know that sounds crazy, but that's my experience. Not at all. Not at all. 
So I hope that's an explanation. I mean, um, wow. Um, we have a question from the Chovave delegation. Um, and I'd call you to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, I, I have a question for Jeffrey. I was wondering if you could explain a little more about how the Auschwitz temple metaphor works. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it broad like that. I'd love to hear a little bit more about. Well, I, you know, at first I was going to put a tent. And when I thought about the tent shape, I realized that that building is a tent shape. I mean, it's a very strange thing, but that entrance to Auschwitz, and I've seen this, this entrance in, throughout my life, I've been obsessed with it. Um, and uh, the Arbeit macht frei, um, somehow the cruelty of that is part of the sacrifice, the cruelty of putting that on those camps. This is one on Dachau too. Uh, the shape of it suddenly made me think, well, wait a minute, that's an arc. And how, how strange is that? How horrific is that in a way? Um, and, uh, and so if Aaron is asked to put blood on the ark, we certainly did. We certainly spread our blood all over it. So that's the connection for me. But I also didn't want it to dominate the painting. So I, I made it sort of obscured. It's there, but it isn't. Does that answer your question? A little bit? We also have a question from Karen, Ima. Yeah, I, my mind is um, kind of wandering all over listening and um, just engaging with it because I think it's you know, painting is like midrash and that's how you that's how you um, kind of set that up. But I think just even in this last statement, I, I was going to say something else, but even when you talk about the avoda service and how we understand avoda and the service of the heart and that kind of work that we do, how we try to engage with God, I think, and the difference, the contrast with what Arbeit Macht Frei was saying, you know, I think it's that, that place where actually Aaron is the intermediary. And so I really loved what I was gonna say before is that you chose not to make the hands red because there are all kinds of sacrifices that are made. And when you talked about the coloration and how you layered the color, you did say that you put in a layer of red and it is in there and there's a layer of green in there, you know, that you use those colors, but that's not necessarily what emerges. And so the sacrifice, whether or not, you know, it's how we're sacrificing the earth, how we're sacrificing people to this day, or Absolutely. whether it's, you know, whether or not we're doing the service of the heart, I think, you know, it's, it's a priestly kind of responsibility. So I, I just, just dancing all over with the, what you have presented. So thank oh, well, you thank so you. much. Thank yeah. you for your insight there. I, I, um, I'm glad that it, it touches you. I'm glad that it touches people. That was its intention. I mean, what are we here for if not for each other, you know? But, you know, it's also like dancing between a very, very realist, you know, a real, a realist image and a mystical kind of blurred image. So I think that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of duality there that we sure. have to figure out. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, in your presentation, Jeffrey, you focused us, our attentions on the face of Aaron. Aaron directing his eyes upward to Hashem with a question. And in the story of Achremot, the, 
the reading that we do on on Yom Kippur, we hear the 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 voice of Aaron. We hear the aftermath of Aaron after he lost his two children. They were burnt in the Torah says a uh, foreign fire, and mm. an esh zara, and in the aftermath of that trauma, the Torah says that he reacted silently but that mm. doesn't mean that the emotion on his face wasn't present mm. the words didn't leave his mouth but he still bared all of the questions the theological questions that we ask ourselves not of the fire foreign fires of our children perhaps those too but of the foreign fire that afflicted our people in the 20th century and the smoke that obscures the Arbat Macht Frei might make it seem that it's far in the distance, but it looms over our heads so strongly till this day. I'd like to give the final word to the YCT Beit Midrash, but before then, I'd also like to wish everyone uh, a meaningful Yom Kippur one where we allow ourselves to ask these deep theological questions and not just read the words on the surface, but to probe deeper into the Midrash as Jeffrey has shown us an entire year's worth of meditation on topics such as these and an entire lifetime as well that we're all continuing to try and unravel and find our own selves in the paintings that we paint, in the stories that we read that we see the image of our own face put onto Aaron's. YCT. So, uh, I, I'm afraid I have nothing uh, quite profound to say, but I did have a question, uh, which was, what, what was the intent? <clears throat> was there any intention, and, and if so, what, what was the intention that uh, Aaron, uh, if you don't mind me saying Aaron in the picture, uh, Jeffrey looks a lot like you. Uh, was there <laughs> an intention there? Um, was uh, was that on purpose? Uh, if it was, what what was the intention? Um, to be quite honest, I couldn't find another Jew model that I could use. <laughs> <laughs> and at first I was going to, uh, you know, see if there was someone in Albuquerque that I hadn't heard of or somewhere. But uh, in the end, I thought, well, I'll do it. I mean, I, I, I didn't like the idea of doing it for myself. And I would, I would have much preferred to have someone else pose for it. But then when I thought about it, you know, it's a personal journey. So I thought, well, it's sort of relevant anyway. Um, so I use Rabbi, my Rabbi Sachs says today, we no longer have priests and we no longer have prophets. So we each have to be our own priest and our own prophet. Well, there you go. And, uh, you know, I used my own talus. I thought that was uh, relevant. Although it doesn't have gold. What's the name of the things on the side there? Is that, is it, do they have a name? They've got the gold bits. The Atara. What's it called? An Atara. An Atara. Atara. A-T-A-R-A. Atara. 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 It comes from crown. Crown. It's oh, like for okay. Crown. Yeah. So it doesn't have gold ones, but it does have blue stripes. <laughs> okay. I was getting nervous of the ostentatiousness of your life, Jeffrey. Oh, <laughs> You're supposed to be an artist. <laughs> I know. I'm just back in my stretch limo. Um, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Anyway. Well, thank you all, really. Thank you all. Thank you. I can't think of a better way to go into Yom Kippur you. as, uh, as um, uh, the verse so beautifully articulated. So. Really, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And, and, everybody. and thank you also for being the Atara to our final cornerstone articulation in the series of what has been a truly profound year, a year where we've explored so many topics together. I, I really want to extend this moment also to say thank you to all of the artists and rabbis who have 
devoted many hours of sharing Torah and images with one another in making this all possible. Shana Tova. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.